Well, it's good to be here today. i glad you got out of the mud. You got the church out. Amen. The Lord's given us a beautiful day to help us to get the mud, hasn't it? Amen. And it's good to see you here, and I'm glad to be here. I, uh, uh, was sitting at the table this morning, and a lady called Brother Jimmy and said, You know, Brother Manley, he's sick. And, uh, uh Brother Jimmy just kept trying to tell her, Well, 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 he was, you know, but he's doing better. And, uh, I don't know, she must have got a word or something about that. Or maybe they hadn't seen me since I, uh, got down to my running size. <clears throat> but, uh, it was no news to us that I'd been sick, and I was sick. And, uh, I don't think it's any news to the Lord. But, uh, His grace is absolutely adequate and absolutely sufficient and uh, abundantly above what I even need, regardless of how sick I am. But people always asking me, said, how do you feel? And I, I quit poodling with that a long time ago. <laughs> It'd be better if we ask each other how do we, how we faith in it, right. rather than how we're feeling. But if you want to know, I'm feeling fine. I really am. And, um, in fact, I haven't felt as good as I feel now in a long time. But um, I am faith in it as best I understand. And, and I'll tell you, I'm rejoicing. I uh, went and visited with a transplant surgeon uh, here a few weeks ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, he told me, he said, man, I look at these papers and he said, you're dead. He said, but I look in your eyes and I see life. And uh, he said, man, said I'd, uh, he said, hey, man, I'd go for it. I said, I'd get a, somebody else's kid. The only problem with me is I'm wondering what happened at the rapture. Uh, you know, with that kidney business. I am I am praying about it, and uh, I know all a lot of your friends have many years, and uh, uh, I'm just the type of fellow that uh, you know just have to at least look at it, at the potential of what uh, the Lord might have, you know, what, whether or not He has had. Over forty people have offered me uh, kidneys. And I, I think that's so beautiful. I just, uh, first time a person did that, it was a pastor's wife in First Baptist Church, Ferguson, Missouri. And she was a nurse. And I, I it almost offended me because I wasn't expecting me, I wasn't expecting to have to have one. And she walked up and, and well, she discussed it with her husband. It was a very serious matter with her. And offered me a kidney. And I, I didn't know, I tell you, that was overcoming. Uh, but other people have. Uh, but I am praying about it. We're the family's praying about it. And I'm not saying a lot about it because I don't want to put people under uh, pressure uh, that's supposed to be the best donor. And I want them to be led of God, not uh, uh, be uh, sympathetic with me. Uh, because I'm enjoying myself. I don't know about you. I bless God. I'm, I have to have dialysis, but that's no problem to me. Amen. If you had spent Monday morning with me, I flew into Dallas, uh, got to home about 1.30, uh, bed about 1.32 uh, mon Sunday night, Monday morning, got up at 5.30 and uh, had dialysis. Uh, before I came down here, and if you'd have been there that morning, I'll guarantee you that my four hours sitting there in that room uh, with that young lady and a telephone, I had as great a time as any pastor ever has in any one day counseling and, 
and, uh, you know, dealing with the things of God. And, boy, it was a blessed time. And since I've gone on dialysis, I believe everybody doesn't pray three or four hours a day is full of the devil. <laughs> you know, uh, since I don't have any alternative, bless God, I might as well get everybody else in on this. <laughs> But it, uh, I, and I'm not disturbed, and I won't be disturbed if the Lord leads me, leaves me on dialysis. And uh, in fact, uh, I'm uh, going to talk in the next, on uh, Sunday night when I preached in Atlanta, Sunday night, a man came up to me after the service and he said, I'm down here at this uh, disease center in Atlanta. You know, they have a center there where they coordinate and and all the diseases of the world. And I mean, it's a big center. And he said, there's a man down there uh, that's got a Dallas machine that's, that's small enough you can put it in a middle-sized suitcase. Go anywhere in the world. Gave him his name, address, telephone number. And uh, I mean, friend, you just don't try to outguess God. I mean, just don't try to even figure him out. Uh, because about the time you think you've got it all planned out, he'll do something so completely different and so completely uh, of him uh, that it just blow your mind. And I, I'll tell you, it's a blessing just to be able to walk uh, with a living Lord. It really is. And not uh, outguess him. And not be able to outguess him. Because he's always just pouring it on. I mean, just pouring it on. And so... You play with me about that matter uh, of the kidney uh, transplant, but uh, uh, we're not going to get up tight about it one way or the other uh, because the Lord is being too good. And it's always a blessing to come to Milldale and, and uh, be here. Uh, this place has been a very big part of my life, my family's life, and uh, uh, we always enjoy coming. And I enjoy coming for a number of reasons, and it's always a blessing. And I, I tell you, you can hear some great preaching here, and I trust that uh, you, all of us will do some great obeying to the preaching that we have heard and will hear during these days. Now, I want to turn to um, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 for the message this morning. I can't get over this swamp water down here. It, uh, it, ta it tastes like a tadpole is thrown. <laughs> but I uh, naturally have always I've never been a Bible teacher. I have uh, always preached out of my experiences and the Word of God, and I uh, don't. I do not know any other way. And and God has blessed and blessed and blessed me, and, and I want to do that this morning. And about three o'clock this morning, I was thinking about. Uh, you know, the um, message today, and I was thinking about so many people here that's heard me preach so many times, and I thought, well, now, there's nothing new to that bunch. You know, they know everything. And uh, and the Lord seemingly, seemingly agreed with me. They do. But he said they're not obeying everything they know. And said sometimes preaching is not only in, only to inform, but it's to inspire and enable us to uh, uh, just step out and obey the truth of God that we've heard. I know one of the one of the number one fears in my life. I I have a one fear that supersedes all other fear. And that is that there is a promise left me in this Bible that fits my situation and I do not find it 
And I do not mix that promise with faith and experience it. I fear that. Recently, we uh, had our daughter-in-law, one of our daughter-in-laws, we have two, uh, and one on the way. So far away, we haven't found her yet. Uh, John hadn't found her. And, uh, but we, we didn't lose one. We know where she is. But she uh, went to heaven. And the thing that uh, bothered me back in those days, and it uh, still bothers me just a little, uh, not a great deal, some, is that there may have been a promise in this book that fit her situation according to the will of God. And I didn't find it and did not mix it with faith. Most of the time in the Bible, fear is sin. But there's a time when the Bible says fear Less a promise having been left you. Right. You fail in reality to discover that promise and take it on into the next verse. Mix it with faith and see God convert the promises of this book into living reality in your life and my life. You see, a lot of you aren't aware of this, and many of you are, especially the crowd this uh, time. Many of you are. But about, what, 81? How many years ago was that? I was seated right over here, right over here, right about where Danny and his wife is. That pew word was not there. We weren't rich enough to have pews in those days. Uh, we almost didn't have chairs. But uh, but uh, we had a big old lounge chair sitting right there. And I was in it. Now, folks, if I look sickly now, you ought to have seen me then. Because my head was flopping. And I couldn't lift my arms. Not, not one inch could I lift my arms this high like this. I can only move them six inches like this. And my tongue had somewhat collapsed to where I could not articulate words. And the greatest test came. For several months, God had given me a promise. And for seven months, we prayed. And we would meet with people at different places. And and some of the people that were healthy enough would fast and pray. And for seven months, we prayed. And before, one day, God gave me a promise, 1.30 in the morning, that I'd live to see my children's children. And for the next six months, I continued to die. And the crises, the ultimate end, came right there in that seat. When a man got up in this pulpit, and said, God told me to pray for Brother Manley this week. And I'm going to pray that he'll be healed. And God said to me, he said, don't pay any attention to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I never will forget it. I was sitting over in that chair. And I was so far gone physically that my friends would uh, come all the way around here. Now, they wouldn't even come back down that way. That's right, because they couldn't stand uh, the, uh, the experience of standing there talking to me in my condition uh, because I was so far gone. But I had to get up in this pulpit, and I think it took six men to hold me up. Best I remember. One man, one person just had to hold my head up because it's plopping. And, uh, and say, now I know it looks like I'm going to die. But folks, I'm going to make it. Do you remember that? And I will be back to preach. So every time I stand here, I remember 
that moment. I, that was a crisis, my friends, that I had to, when the doctors and everyone else was saying, he'll not make it, but just one or two people felt like a wood, and I, they were very scarce. My friend looked like I would not. I had to stand up here and say, I am going to make it. That's right. I'm going to make it. And uh, you're not looking at no spook this morning. I'm not but about 134 pounds. I'm the smallest person in our family. In fact, I'm the smallest person that's staying at Brother Jimmy's house this week. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, friend. It's flesh and blood, bone. It's not a spook. God kept his promise. I'll tell you, he did it. He kept his promise. And he's still keeping it. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about the greatest promise that I personally have ever found in the Bible. And this is the greatest promise that I personally have ever found uh, to me. And um, I'll tell you, it... Uh, it's nothing new, but a lot of us need to get stirred and moved to mix the Word of God with faith and move out. And uh, as our dear brother was preaching about revival, I, I got news for you. Uh, corporate revival, my friends, we may not have seen like we have hoped for and longed for and prayed for and believed God for. And you may have given up, but I hadn't. We're still going. But personal revival, friend, if you're not living in a personal revival right now, it's either because you're ignorant or you are not willing to pay the price. Amen. And then, my friends, it's possible to be ignorant, and I don't mean that ugly. I mean the fact that you just don't know that personal revival and the reality of God is available to you right now, regardless of your circumstances. Yes, sir. You can have that, my dear friends. I guarantee you can have that on the bedside. and uh, You can have that anywhere, wherever, whatever the circumstances may be. Amen. I was in rehab. They were teaching me to walk again. And I, I ought to do this this morning, but I won't do it again. I, you know, we have several preachers of doom uh, here. And uh, they came to visit me in the hospital, went away and planned my funeral. Said he won't make it. About five of them sitting right here this morning. I can see one, two, three right here just... I mean, almost in touching distance. Now, Brother Mac, we, I know you was with that bunch, but did you say that? Oh, well, you're great. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I was in rehab, learning to walk. I could not walk, and I was learning to walk. And uh, I'd go down that rehab, and Martha always wanted me to look. Nice. If, that, if, it, if I have something nice looking on and, and it coordinates and it's all in line, you can be assured that Martha dressed me. And uh, she fixed it up so I'd put it on because I'd put on a purple pair of breeches and a green pair of socks as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't make any difference. But uh, anyway, uh, she always wanted me to comb my hair. But she never, obviously didn't realize that I never could get my hand up here to comb my hair. And I'd go down there at rehab looking like a, you know, a hair down my face and everything else. And this little lady came by one day and she said, what's your name? I said, Manly Beasley. She said, I thought so. She said, um, you know, one day they told me you were going to die. That you'd die any time. And she said, I walked in there by your bed with another doctor and said, I looked down in your face and I said to my doctor friend, 
He's not going to die. Said he is off right now with his God. Having a wonderful time. And I don't care what they say, he's not going to die. She was a doctor. And she was telling this to her doctor friend. And this is weeks and weeks, weeks later in that rehab. She said, I knew you were going to make it. Now, friend, I tell you what, you can have revival when you're so unconscious you don't know it. Because I was totally unconscious of that woman ever visiting me. Amen. I was totally unconscious, but she walked in there, looked in my face, and saw God. Yes, sir. Now, folk, I don't care what the circumstances are. You can have revival. And boy, if you're not having it, you're missing something. You say, Preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the reality of Jesus Christ that supersedes all of the circumstances that you find yourself in. Amen. Every moment of every day, wherever you are. Yes, sir. One time my heart quit beating. You say, Preacher, what are you doing? I'm standing on the porch. Because you're going to be upset when I get in the house. Uh, uh, I was, uh, one time I was, had a problem and went to the hospital and my heart quit beating and two preachers were there and, and uh, my wife was sitting out there and, I, and she and God, you know, she, she's always cutting up. The only, thing, the only time you can get know the real Martha is when things get tough. And uh, if you see her any time else, you don't see the real uh, person. Uh, you just think you do. She's just putting on a facade. She's playing games. But when the things get tough, you know, it's, she's like the old mule that you, the old man sold and it wouldn't work and brought him back. And told the fellow that bought him from said, this old mule won't do a thing. Said, you, won't, you can't tell him anything. He went over and got a tube before and hit the old mule over the head and the old mule fell out on the ground and said, now tell him something. <laughs> and the old mule obeyed. Now, that's, Martha, you have to get her attention. <laughs> and I'll tell you, friends, the sailors used to say this about a ship. This is the best thing they could say. She will do in a storm. Whew. That's it. Well, I forgot where I was headed. <clears throat> Ma'am? Right. Martha's sitting out there just in tune with God, and that old pastor, he just was shook to pieces because he thought she didn't have an ounce of God in her because she, all she's doing is cutting up. And now she was out there, and I was in there dying and she's out there in glory. Wasn't even upset at all. She just had it all settled. <laughs> and so this these two dear brothers and one of them sitting here this morning was running in and out of that emergency room and, and my heart quit beating and I took off. And in a few minutes I came back without them having to shock me. And uh, one of them said to Brother Manley said, uh, Said, you sure look like you've had a good time. I said, yeah, I've been in a meeting. But he said, I said, you boys weren't there. <laughs> so, friend, I hope this morning that you're there. Amen. I hope you're there. Praise God. If you're not there, that's what this meeting's all about. It's getting you there. Right, Brother Jerry? <laughs> Amen is getting you there. Right. Yes, sir. If I have as many lives as I have had deaths, bless God, I'm going to live to be 500 years old. <laughs> and I've got news for you, friend. You can have God in the midst of it all. Absolutely, totally 
adequate. More than adequate. Excuse me, more than adequate. You may not believe it, but I'm preaching right along the line of my text. You just hadn't found it yet. Let me read it to you. I can get the tears out of my eyes. God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Uh, let's just look at this verse and let's look at it backwards for just a moment. What is every good work? It's the work that God has initiated and wants you to do. It's what God has planned and how He plans it for your life. That's the good work. And now, my dear friends, with that in mind, go back to the first phrase and it says, God is, and I'm glad that little is is there because that means it wasn't, that He is not a was. <clears throat> I just think about that a little bit, folks. He wasn't. I mean, folks, he's not back under somewhere. No, sir, right now. He is. And God is. Hey, by, by the way, he's not up the road somewhere. He is. And best I understand that, that means he is right now. God. God and all that he is, he is right now. Oh, my, what a promise. Now, I'll tell you, this is some promise. And uh, so, uh, we're not only here. See, God, he says God is able. And not only that, but he says to make all grace. Now, my problem this morning is, this is such a promise to me, and this verse means so much to me, that I'll, I'm going to have to go on. I won't ever get through. Run, done. Won't get to preach till midnight tonight. And God is able to make all grace. Now, folks, if you, uh, how much is all? There is no way that the human mind can comprehend the all grace of God. But here he says, God is able to make all grace. Not only that, but look at this. Abound towards you. And I mean, he gets personal with it, doesn't he? That doesn't say all grace abound towards Brother Jimmy. It says all grace abound towards you. And my dear friends, not only does it say all grace abound towards you, but it says that you always... And why, look at that. How much is always? There is not one moment that, my dear friends, it's not always. There's not one second that's not always. He said, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all Goodness, I mean, this verse fascinates me. Having all sufficiency. Can you imagine that? He didn't stop there. All sufficiency in what? All things. Now, I'm going to tell you, friend, that to me is one of the most unbelievable Statements from God I have ever found in the Bible. I mean, God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. I mean, God, my friends, has it all there for you in your bank account if you can discover it and take it by faith. For God is able. Now, I don't think God's interested in, 
enabling you to do some things he uh, is not in, and such like that. But I'll tell you, friends, the things that God, the things that he's in for you and me, he is there to make them real. Uh, this verse doesn't say, God is able as long as you're in good health. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say God is able as long as the economy is good. It doesn't say God is able until you get 65. It doesn't say God is able as long as you feel good. It just doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. My dear friends, this is an unlimited, I mean statement from God to the person that God can give it to and that person can believe it. We have a lot of people pre speaking, preaching today, said if you give, you can get rich. And what they're talking about a lot of times mean, means if you give, you can get money back and get rich financially. But this verse tells you how rich you can get. And my dear friends, you can have the all grace, all sufficiency, in all things, always. I'll tell you, that's the wealth of the saints. One time I had an experience of a man wanting to support me and to pay me a salary. And uh, the Lord said no. And uh, the answer was, friend, I can't do it because you don't have enough. You see, you're only worth a couple of million and I might need more. If I trust the Lord, I have got all sufficiency. Now, see, you and I have a little trouble with this because it's the Word of God. And you and I do not see it, smell it, taste it, feel it, and hear it. And so, thereby, we have a little trouble with this verse. But, friend, if you have trouble with this verse, on that account, you have trouble with relationship with God anyway. Because neither can you see, smell, taste, feel, or hear Him. The only way you can relate to God is by faith. And the only way you can relate to this verse of Scripture is by faith. So if you can accept the Lord by faith, by the same principle, you can absolutely discover this verse, claim it, stand on it, and experience it. All grace! Always. I mean, friend, that's, that's a whole lot. Right? And the amazing thing about it, I can enjoy the fullness of that verse and not deplete one ounce of God relationship to you. Amen. If I trust God for all of His grace, for a given occasion, it doesn't take one ounce of grace away from you. You can do it too, and we not deplete the grace of God. I mean, just won't deplete it. Because His grace is so bountiful. All of His grace. Can you imagine such a verse in the Bible? There's a paraphrase that says, Your work before God is determined by your ability to believe the truth and convert the truth from the pages of the Bible into reality in your life. It's one thing, my dear friends, to know the truth, but it's another thing to believe the truth. When you know the truth, you have heard what God has to say. But when you believe the truth, you have made it possible for God to make the truth real in your person. And a lot of people are learning the truth 
intellectually but not experiencing the truth experientially. Now this was some passage of Scripture. And um, it's my passage of Scripture that I stand on, live on, and I guess die on. I, because my dear friends, it's, it's the best I've found. And I believe it's adequate. Don't you? But now th- think with me a little bit. Who in the world was Paul addressing this verse of Scripture to in the literal sense that he was writing to the church at Corinth? He was writing to the church at Corinth. The Spirit of God writing through him. And my dear friends, he was laying this verse out. So I want you to look at that church at Corinth for just a moment. You see, there was a need up in Jerusalem. And Paul says in these two chapters, and I'll tell you, this, these two chapters fascinate me. Right in the middle of this book, there's two chapters on finances. And that fascinates me, uh, that, that he would do that. But anyway... There was a need up in Jerusalem, and I get the idea that when this bunch at Corinth heard about that need up in Jerusalem, somebody jumped up and popped off and said, Bless God, let's have a business meeting. Let's vote right now to give them $10,000. They did, they did something that got them on the spot. It's always get on, good to get on the spot, because until you're on the spot, you will never get to where God wants you to get. And so, um, this month said, let's do this and let's do that and so on and so forth. And they decided about giving this bunch up in Jerusalem an offering. And Paul deals with this in this, these two passages. He said, you know, he said, there is, no, there is no need in the world that there's not a supply for it. He said, this time this one has got it, and this one doesn't, so this one over here gives to this one over here. And then next time this one's got it, and this one doesn't, so this one gets The problem is not supply, folks. It's available. The problem is distribution. And that's what Paul says here in this passage, that the problem is in distribution. He doesn't stop there. <clears throat> He's writing to this church and he said, let me tell you about a church. In fact, he said, uh, you know, I'm, a couple of fellows are coming over there. And um, obviously they'd had about a year to take this offering up that they said they are going to give. And so uh, he said, so and so is coming over there, a couple of men's coming over there and and said, by the way, if you don't give it, they're going to wring it out of you. And uh, then he went on to say, he said, by the way, I'm coming by and I'm bringing a fellow from Macedonia. And when I get there, I do not intend to be embarrassed by you folk neglecting your responsibility. Right? I mean, folk, he was laying it on. And he said, anyway, I want to tell you about a church. I want to tell you about a church that was poor but became rich. And it was a church in Macedonia. And when I say rich, I'm talking about, my dear friends, more than money, but I am talking about money. Right? And by the way, this verse... All grace, all sufficiency, and all things always will preach anywhere in the world. Yes, sir. And it will work anywhere in the world, regardless of the economy, regardless of the condition. Whether you get healed or not, it still applies. Some people, God snatches out of problems. Some people he delights in blessing them in the problem. This verse applies either way. 
Amen. I mean, it applies to everybody, everywhere, anytime, any place. Regardless of your age. Regardless of your insurance. That doesn't mean he doesn't use insurance. It doesn't mean he doesn't use old age. My friends, this is a promise from God. And the writer here, is Paul, is saying, I will tell you about a church down there in Macedonia that was poor but became wealthy. And my friends, you have to believe that he included finances as well as all the other things. And he told that bunch, said, you've got a lot of different graces. He said, I want you to get in on this grace of giving. Right? And my dear friends, he taught them about the church in Macedonia. And there were three things about that church in Macedonia. And that makes up the, somewhat of the context of this fabulous, unbelievable promise. Three things about them. One is, they first gave themselves, according to the 8th chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. They first gave their own selves to the Lord. Verse 5. My friends, they gave it. They took their hands completely off, totally off of their life. And we all... Always singing, He is Lord. And every time I see a bunch of people saying, He is Lord, I think about a deacon that I knew one time. And uh, he would not sing, I surrender all. I'll have thine own way. He would not sing that song. And so one day I went to him and I said, to this deacon, I said, why don't you sing that song? He said, because my little boy is standing by me, and he knows me. And he said, I said, I don't understand. He said, well, I don't want to teach him that you can lie in the church house and still get by with it. He said, because he knows that I have not surrendered all. And I am not willing for God to have completely His way. And if I sing that song, I will be indicating to Him that He can lie and get by with it. You see, you have to give yourself so completely that you can sing any song any invitation go through anything that God wants you to go through and you really never know whether or not he's Lord until he calls on something that he has allowed you to manage yes sir you see when he's Lord that means you have given him everything and anyone can say, he's got it all. He's got it all. All to Jesus I have surrendered. And we can say that until he comes one day and says, uh, I would like to have your help. Uh, uh, I would like to have a measure of your wealth. If, see, it's mine, and I have, since you've given everything to me, I have left it there for you to be a steward over it, and now I'm wanting some of it. I, I need it. I need to invest in some paper to print Bibles in Russia. Well, now, now listen, friends, if, if, he's, if you've given it to him, he has all the right in the world. All the right in the world. In fact, if you are paying attention to the Holy Spirit of God, 
Uh, you are not sitting in the corner and him having to ring the bells to get your attention. You're standing on your tiptoes watching to see if there's any kind of light flashing in his eyes that might indicate to you he's got something in mind. You know, in Romans 8, it says, Mind the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. You know what that means to me? When I was a little old boy, I'd go to church. I had to mind my mama. And friends, she didn't have to come over with a switch. After the first two or three times, all she had to do was just look right. And I could see in her eyes exactly what she was saying. And as long as I minded Mama, everything went smooth. But when I put mind in Mama, folk, it got tough. And I'm telling you, we're supposed to mind the Holy Spirit of God. And this church in Macedonia that was poor became rich. And by the way, I'm not just talking about money. I, I know one person that gets four million dollars a year just off of interest. And my dear friend, financially, the world would say he's rich. But he'll call and say, preacher, in essence, and I'm putting words in his mouth because I know what I mean, I'm in poverty in this area. I'm in poverty in this area. Please pray that God will bring me into the wealth that I need. Can you imagine a man getting four million dollars off of just that's just interest every year? But you see, there's more to this life than just money. But it is also money. If it's not, you're very stupid because you spend eight and ten, twelve, fourteen hours a day working for it. So it must have some significance in your life. Come on. Amen? You do everything you can to save up so you don't have to trust God at the end. Right? And I'm not, not against saving. That's what God tells you to do. do it. But you better mind the Spirit of God. You see, the, they first gave themselves... And we really never know whether we've given ourselves unless He calls for something He owns that we've given to it. Yes, sir. And He calls on it. And if we have given it to Him, we say, Yes, sir, Lord, it's yours. Bless God, let's have at it. Amen. Right? If it's completely, solidly, absolutely his you won't have any any trouble when he calls for it they first gave themselves then it says they gave according to their ability now what's that what do you think that means you know what I believe means I believe my dear friends in that they had given everything over to God God said okay you run it. And I will call for it. As I see fit for it. And he comes one day and says, uh, I want this. And you see through the Word of God that God uh, teaches to give. And so on. And you give this. You give this. You give this. And then one day he comes back and he says, uh, I want this. I want this. And my dear friends, He calls on us to give then what we have in the account that we've given to Him. That's what they, what it says. They gave according to the ability. Right? Stephen Offord tells about how his dad was such a mighty, mighty, mighty giant 
Oh, Lord, God, if he says he was a giant, I really wonder what he was. Because he's such a giant. He said his dad was one of the most successful missionaries in South Africa with the black people. And I've heard him say this. He said, you know why? He said, because one day he turned his life completely over to God. He said, but that's not all. He said, when God said uh, to his dad, I want you to go as a missionary to these black people. He said, well, Lord, you will have to give us direction as to what to do in order to reach them because no one seems to be reaching. And he said, you know, the Lord called on my dad to do something he could do that he had within his account to do. By the way, you know what it was? He was a, Stephen Offord was a little baby, a few months old. And Stephen Offord's daddy was led of God to take him, Stephen Offord, as a baby, naked in his hand, and walk in to the village of a hostile bunch of people holding that baby out and walking to the leader of, of that tribe and putting that baby in his hand. Now, folks, that was within the bank account that Mr. Alford had turned over to God. And he could afford to do that. Not knowing what they would do with that boy. And I've heard Stephen Alford say that that man would look at me according to what my mother and dad would tell me. And then he would give it to the next and the next and the next. And he'd be passed from one leader to the other until he was so nasty and covered with lice that the mama would take him and wash him, get the lies off of him, and give him back. And those people said, if this man loves us this much, surely we can hear what he's got to say about whatever he's preaching. My friend. You see, this bunch of... Macedonia did not only give themselves, but they gave what they could afford. Now, you may not have given yourself yet, but my dear friends, God calls on us to give what we can afford. You know, I, I have a had a very unbelievable life. I was a seventh grade dropout, told in the third grade that I was too dumb to ever learn to read and write. And when I went to college, I could not read or write. And I'll assure you that right now, I do not have over about an eighth grade level of reading material that I'm not used to. And I probably do not. In fact, my in, two of my grandsons can, I know one of them, can outspell me right now. And when I gave all I had to Jesus, one day God came and, and I had so manipulated so I could make it in life that God says, I've got to make you weak. And I want to make you weak so I can use you like I want to use you. And friends, he did not call on me to do something I couldn't do. That was within the bank account. Amen? Yes, sir. Right? And I can afford, I don't know about you, but I can afford to go through what I'm going through. 
I can afford it. You may not, but I can. You know why? I don't have any right not to. Because I gave it all to Him. That wasn't only the money. That was my life. Amen. And that's the family. And I can afford that. My friend, they not only gave themselves, then they gave according to the measure of the ability that was left with them after the giving themselves. That meant everything they had belonged to God, and God could put his finger on it any time on it. Amen. And he would do it according to not their need, but somebody's need over here. Right? Right? And he moved it around and kept shifting it around. And he's always done that. But then they gave what they could not afford. You say, what do you mean? Right here in the first five verses of um, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, it says they gave themselves, they gave what they could afford, and then they gave... What they could not afford. How in the world do you do that? Well, I'm not going to deal with it, but in this passage, I mean in these two chapters, did you know that he says he will even give you seed to sow? In other words, when you don't have it to give, that God might multiply it, he will give it to you so you can give it. And my friend, you can give what you can't afford. And it's only when you're out there giving what you can't afford to give that you have to trust God. And it's only when you're having to trust God that you are at God's disposal. And it's only then, my dear friends, that he has a vehicle by which he can work and manifest his glory. And it's only then when he can walk you into the wealth he's got that you don't know anything about. Otherwise, my dear friends, he would have let the children of Israel go on into the land of Canaan uh, when they got to Kadesh Barnea, but he shut them out. You know why? Because they would not trust him. And trusting means a cessation of self-effort. That means you're coming to the end of yourself and turning it so completely to God that He's got the everything. Not once and for all, but at that moment. And when you're at God's disposal like that, then He can do you like He did the crowd that went in 40 years later. He had a vehicle by which He could get glory. He went around the walls of Jericho for seven days. And on the seventh day, seven times. Brother, I've got news for you. He got glory out of that much. And he walked them after he taught them at at, uh, uh, Jericho. He walked them into land they did not earn. He walked them into houses they did not build. He walked them into food that they did not grow. My dear friends, he brought them into the wealth that he had for them. And God brings us into the wealth that he has for us only when we get out there and trust him to do what we can afford to do. Yes, sir. Amen. You get out there and trust him. Let me just just share one little line of testimony with you. I was living here, and the first years of my life, the Lord said, uh, no insurance. And I didn't take my wife to the doctor or go to the doctor. I didn't have to go to the doctor myself. Uh, I didn't take my wife to the doctor or anything else and say, now, doctor, I don't have any insurance. Help me now. Uh, Now, I'm a preacher. That's God. I can't stand these begging. Beg 
Hag and Hinton. Preacher. Right. Looking for discounts. Your God broke? It's wise to be wise. A good deal is a good deal, but my dear friends, let me tell you something. To mealy mouth and put yourself in a position to where you try to obligate people because of your poverty is sinful. And sacrifice, sacrifice, my dear friends, is not you not having faith and receiving something. That's not sacrifice. That's sin. Sacrifice is when you have it or could have it and refuse it. A lot of people tell me, Boy, oh, I'm walking by faith and my God's real and, and I'm sacrificing for Jesus. And all they mean is, I just don't have faith. And so they call their unbelief sacrifice. Sacrifice is when you have it or could have it, and you definitely, deliberately make the choice to refuse it or give it away. Well, the Lord said no insurance. And I never had to tell a doctor, when the children were born, we don't have the money or something like that. Now, there's some crises in there and ups and downs in there, and it wasn't all smooth, but it never is smooth when you're growing up as a baby. And everything is never perfect as a baby growing up. But right here in this place, living in that house right up there, God spoke to my heart one day and said, take out hospitalization insurance. And I went downtown Baton Rouge and found out I had a blood pressure problem. They rated me a little high. And, well, I just had a discontentment in my spirit that I should not get that insurance. So the next week or two, I went to North Carolina sitting at a uh, cafeteria in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. A man walked up to me that I never knew. And he said, Preacher, I have an insurance policy for you. I never will forget. I didn't lie. I said, Well, friend, I have a blood pressure problem and I'd glad to create a problem. He said, No, this is a new grouping and you can come in with any problem you've got. 